Let's give the Lord a hand. Let's praise the Lord for Pastor Merle and the work that she's doing. Praise God. I, I wanted to bring some things to your attention. Uh, now that this week we have a new president. So. The, the election is, how many are grateful that campaign season is over? Yeah. Uh, if for nothing else, it, it was very entertaining. But also very revealing at the same time that things are shifting. Uh, that you can't just gaslight people and they just believe everything that you say. Uh, and, and I'm not going to get into, you know, one side or the other, but I, I do have to get into certain facts that when you start to try to scare people too much, people start to rebel against it when you start asking too many questions. Um, one side was like, well, it's a threat to our democracy, threat to our democracy. Um, and man, if you listen to that, it got you scared, right? People, people who really believed it, who were vulnerable. I'm not talking about the campaign strategists. No one in the campaign strategists believed that because uh, if it was true that somebody in four years, I want you to see what I'm saying without being biased about your candidate. If it was true, because then people on one side, if the other candidate lost, they would also be very, very sad and they're going to say, well, we lost the country. We weren't going to lose the country. And so both sides had extreme views because they were trying to get people to make a decision. And sometimes because people are proven to be so gullible, you have to force them into a decision. It's very unfortunate where we are. And it's proven that if you spend enough billions of dollars, you can get people to think whatever you want if you're, you know, in, your face, in their face all the time. But some of the saddest things, saddest takeaways is that I really believe that people think we're stupid. I think they thought, eat both sides, they'd just get up there and say whatever they want, that we're just going to believe them because they said it. That because they sold records and because they made movies, that all of a sudden they're, they have the right to tell us what to think. And I think what you saw was, was a rebellion against trying to tell me what I think. And you see a lot of people who were going to go one way went the other, and there was a lot of, a lot of switching. And you see by the evidence of the of the electoral map that what you see is rebellion. Now, I don't know if anything's going to change, but I can tell you this. From one day, it goes to, if we don't vote this way, it's going to be disaster. We're going to lose the world and everybody has to move out of the United States. And then the same people saying it were like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. We can't lose hope. Everything's going to be fine. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If everything was going to be fine, why were you making everyone panic as if the whole world's going to end if this one person who can only work for four years, some of y'all getting a new car, got to pay this thing off in five. He's out of there in four. You can't pay off a car in four years, but, he, but one person's going to ruin the world in four years. And the dictators that have been there for 20, 30 years already, they haven't even dented it. But you, you see what happens when you just, you know, that saying, if it's on the internet, must be true. That used to actually be true at one point. Journalism used to be non-biased. You used to listen to the news and they'd give you the facts and they kept their opinion to themselves until ratings of opinion news became more popular than realistic news. And so the actual uh, news journalism uh, that doesn't report their bias uh, actually doesn't get any attention at all. Very, very little attention. And people are willing to just hear people that think like them and that's very dangerous. When you just listen to people that are talking what you talk, you become a, a self-defeating algorithm. It's like if you go to social media, it's just gonna spit you what you like. Oh, you like more videos about this? I'm gonna give you more about that. And people are looking at a algorithm thinking, oh, the whole world thinks like this. Very dangerous. But what I saw was more a common sense approach where people's like, all right, 
It's not about this, it's not about that. It's the fact that I'm seeing something in front of my own eyes and they're telling me it ain't what I see. And I think that's what we saw in this election. And I think we have to continue down the road of listening to yourself. That what you see on either sides, both people lie. It's impossible for them not to. Nobody's perfect. But God is. And when God tells you something, this is like this, you have to follow it. And so let's continue to pray because we're not out of the woods. I think what happened with this election, I think that disaster, calamity is always on the way. I think this pushed it forward just a little bit and gave a little bit of a grace period for us to rethink our strategy as a nation, rethink our strategies and our communities and say, okay, how do we want to build this thing? Okay, what direction do we go? If, if, if the world is already rejecting the gaslighting and, and fear mongering, all this kind of stuff, so where are we going? So now voices, true voices are going to have a voice. So what are you going to say? What are you going to think? Who are you going to allow yourself to be influenced by? When the people that were influenced you had, were, were getting paid to influence you in a certain way. One of the saddest things I saw was the reaction of some people who were just completely uh, against the right, the, the Republican Party. And one woman actually said, and I couldn't believe she said this. I went from, wow, that's ridiculous to, is this real? The woman said, maybe you saw it. She was crying the night like she goes, I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow and they're going to bring back slavery. And I went, for a second I was like, ah, that's ridiculous. Then I said, what if this person actually believes this? What kind of demonic hold is on someone's life for them to admit in front of the world that they actually believe in their core that slavery is going to return after all we've been through? You really believe that? I went from thinking it was ridiculous to feeling sad and I had to pray. I said, Lord, help everyone in our country who's, who is hurting because there's a demonic hold on them and, and their mind went so far. The Bible says a little bit of yeast leavens the whole loaf. Sometimes you don't know what it does when you make someone panic. You make someone panic and they'll go all the way to the other side of what it is. Just because the, the root of their mind is already poisoned and is already toxic, anything you add to that mind is going to continue to throw them off. We are facing a time in our nation that we have never seen before the levels of anxiety in our youth. Levels of anxiety in the young adults as we see them today. And there's such a difference between people that are, have anxiety and people that have wisdom. It's like three worlds apart. It's not even close. And so we're going to continue to have this opposition in our country. Okay, this, 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 because the enemy is working off the fear that he was able to create during this campaign season. It's not going to go away. It's going to continue. See, it didn't used to be like this that you were afraid to say who you were voting for. It didn't used to be like that because it wasn't that serious. But when you're used as a strategy, okay, to go against someone and insult their person, where people were saying, if you voted for this person, I never want to talk to you again. I s what? And they said it with feeling. If you voted for this person, I never, you're not my friend and you're not my this. And I disown you because, so we're not allowed to think freely anymore. So you only are my family, my friend, if I think like you, which means I should not have any thoughts. I should just ask you what you think. So you, you see how the enemy's doing? He's programming us to throw away our free thinking. And to subject ourselves, we just got over this people pleasing. We just got over this. Now we're going back. Do you see the enemy doesn't have any new tricks? It's the same old trick 
to get you into being a people pleaser again, to get you to throw away your opinion, to acquiesce to what your, your five friends think about, so you go back to being average of what the people in your circle think, going back to looking for people approval. Folks, didn't we just get over this? I remember when the Lord had, had, had swept the whole country trying to rid us of this problem of looking for people's approval and trying to people please and getting rid of our identity and getting our voice back. Now the enemy is trying to get us slowly back into, if you don't think like me, I don't like you. So now everyone who has a low self-esteem, everyone who has low confidence is now going, maybe I should just think like my friends. Fight that in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is the time that we got to get our minds back, get objectivity back, get the facts back and start to empower ourselves to make our own decision. And if you have a friend that would ever tell you, if you do this, I'm not your friend. Say thank you for your service in my life. Today is the last day. I cannot be friends with you. My personal standards forbid me from fellowshipping with you anymore because all you want to do is put me in your prison of your thoughts. Now, you go free to go and find those friends that think like you, but that's, I, that used to be me. I used to value my opinion based on what my friends thought. I used to value myself based on what the world was doing, but the Bible taught me different to not go with the flow of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, which means I have to constantly reconsider what's going on. So even if you voted and your candidate won, you have to rethink your thoughts. You have to monitor everything now. Everything new that is said. Don't just say, okay, I voted, I leave it alone. No, you gotta pay attention to these folks. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And when, and, and when it's not going the way God wants it, you have to come against it and voice your opinion in the name of Jesus, amen? Thank you, Jesus. Mark chapter 4. Verse number 39. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. I'm going to read out of the ESV. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Whenever Jesus arises and shows up on a situation, the first thing he does is establish peace. He establishes calm, which tells you he already has a predetermined setting in him of peace of calmness because he already knows how things are supposed to be calamity is a sign that things are thrown off balance and you will see that everything that he created has a way to go back to where it's supposed to be the sea knew how to be calm and he wants you to understand the same thing today that when calamity wants to overtake you there has to be a calmness in your soul there, if, if you are struggling right now at this moment with anxiety, if you're struggling with worry, if you're struggling with panic, if you're struggling with the unknown, you're going to have a very hard time receiving the word of God today. Okay? Worry is the opposite catalyst you need to receive the word of God. You need faith. And why do you need faith? Because faith is a substance. It is an actual thing. It is that thing that is in hope. 
The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders obtain everything that they have, they obtained it by this thing, this, this thing that's inside hope that is the complete opposite of worry. Faith says, I don't care what it looks like. I have already been given a word from heaven. It doesn't matter. Jesus said, it doesn't matter what the wind and the wave want to do. You're going to do what I say you're going to do. And based on what's inside of me, I want to see it outside of me. So when Jesus said peace, it's because peace was in him. And he called the thing outside to act like what was inside. Peace and stillness. Whenever God asks you to change an environment, he doesn't ask you to pull from somewhere else to bring it here. He asks you to take what's in you and manifest it outside. That's why before you worry about your situation being okay, ask yourself, am I okay? If what's in me comes outside of me, what is my environment like? If I have power and anointing on the inside, then I can demand it to be in my environment immediately in the name of Jesus. This is what you don't understand about worship. The reason why we do worship before the word is to give you an opportunity to come back to yourself. To give you an opportunity to wake up your soul and to say, okay, let me, let me get into this thing because I'm about to receive from God. Worship is you giving him. The word is him giving you, but in order for him to give you, you have to have ears to hear. That's why you set the environment. You set the environment. Hello, somebody. So, so check your area real quick. Check your area. Make sure there's no distraction. Make sure there's no confusion. Make sure there's no panic and calamity. And bring peace to your road. Bring peace to your ears. And let the word of God dwell in you richly. See, it's more important that we spend time in preparation of the word than the actual word. Because if you prepare enough, all you need is two or three words and you're set for the whole week. All you need maybe is one idea and, and it puts together everything that you've been thinking. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we have gathered here together in unity to bring heaven to earth, to open up the eyes of the blind and there is blindness in us. Even if we saw yesterday, we are still blind to many things today. Not because it isn't there, but because we cannot see is the reason why we don't have. We don't even ask because we don't know what to ask for. And in the middle of the greatest time in human history to be alive, we are also the most anxious people that have ever lived. How could it be that all of the answers that we need are at our fingertips? How could it be that we have more technology to handle our problems than ever before? How could it be that we have more instructional videos on what everything can do down to the last detail, yet we have more anxiety about the unknown? And we have never had more information about the unknown. Ignorance is becoming obsolete yet we are still anxious because we thought that if we entered the flesh we would be calm and we are finding out that peace is spiritual the flesh does not create cannot create or sustain peace the flesh is never satisfied when it wants information it needs more information and if you give it more information it wants more 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 when we give into our flesh whether for lust or for good it never ceases to want our flesh has been corrupted every single way so father we transition from our flesh into the spirit now that we may hear in the spirit learn in the spirit rejoice 
in the spirit. If anyone in this place or listening right now is, is disconnected from their peace, I challenge you to find it in the name of Jesus. Take the next 10 seconds and find the peace of the Lord. Wherever you lost it, wherever you left it, Father, we bring it back now in the name of Jesus. We cast out worry and we cast out desperation. We cast out confusion and we bring in the power of love, of power and of a sound mind, Lord God. Let your word enter into us because thy entrance of your word gives light unto me. Light us up, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Bring us back to the day of our salvation, the day when we believed you before confusion got us, before malice got a hold of us. While we were yet innocent, Lord God, there was a space in our heart that we had time for you where we focus and concentrate on you. Father, we need to go back there right now in the name of the Lord so that the plans of the enemy get wiped out, Lord God, that he has to go back to the drawing board, Lord Jesus, because transformation is happening in this place, whether we like it or not, transformation is gonna happen in this place in the name of Jesus. Father, for these next 45 minutes, I pray that you may be in this place. And after those 45 minutes, open up, Lord God, the altar, that the Spirit of God may rest on us, Lord, that we may break curses, that we may break chains, that we may break strongholds. Today is the day of deliverance, and we shall open up our heart for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God. Give somebody a high five around you, tell them let's go to work. Amen. Let's go to work. Get your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm going to read verse 1 through 11. Um, if somebody can give Pastor a mic, if she can help me to read. Test. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. I will challenge you today to fight to pay attention, come against your inability to have attention and ask the Lord to give you an attention span that you may learn again to value time with God. The time will come where it's going to be very difficult for you to connect. And on those days, you're going to wish you paid attention when you had to pay attention while, while it was the opportunity to pay attention, these are the things that can save your soul. Many times we uh, fail because we don't know what to do. And then we regret because we know we heard it, but we didn't hear it good enough. Has that ever happened to you where you know you know, but you didn't pay attention well enough to know exactly what to do? This is one of those days that I challenge you to pay attention to what the Lord wants to say. So let's go into this because uh, I, 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 want, I want to title this, God doesn't start until he's finished. God does not start a thing until he finishes it. Okay, very important for us to understand that. When you don't understand that, you think that God starts something and he's waiting for the end. Uh -huh. That's good. Uh -huh. But he doesn't even start until he works out all the kinks. And after he's finished with a the thing, then he initi initiates it and says, okay, go. And because he's all-knowing and because he is omnipresent and omnipotent, he has all power to be all places at all times and know all things. So it's okay that he knows that you're going to fall because he also knows when you're going to get back up. And he knows what it's going to take to get back up. 
And if you don't have the ability to get up on yourself, he also knows who you're going to intersect with at certain points of your life. And he doesn't have to take away your free will. He just has to give you the chemicals in you. And he put chemicals in someone else. And that's why some relationships cause a chemical reaction. Amen? Amen. All right, let's get into this word. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Mm. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today, mm -hmm. saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Mm -hmm. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Amen. Praise God. So here we see Jesus as inspired the writer of the book of Hebrew through his spirit. Because we know he's inspired because uh, there is no word of God or prophecy that is written by men. But God inspires men to write things that are divine and holy. And any scripture that is written is for our edification. Okay, is good for rebuking and is good for everything to build us up and be strong in the spirit. Now. Here's what we can tell here. He's talking about Sabbath and two types of Sabbath. But he's telling us that in the Sabbath there is rest. Okay? For it starts off saying, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. So there's a promise of rest. It still stands, which means not all of us have entered into his rest. Let us fear lest any one of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news has come to us just as to them. Now he's talking about them, those who heard the word and did not receive it. Okay. His audience of who he's talking to is Christian Jews, the Hebrews, who have received the gospel of Jesus Christ, who are under constant threat of going back to the law. The Apostle Peter addresses this in a different way in the book of Romans, where he compares grace, living under grace, and going back to living under the law. This is why scholars uh, have really determined that Paul is most likely not the uh, leading person of suspicion that has written the book of Hebrews. It is more going towards, and it's, we're speculating because we don't know, because no one took uh, direct credit for writing the book of Hebrews. However, we do see that the possible writing style is closer to Apollos based on the character, the attributes, and the description of how they talked about Apollos and the way that he was. And it, it would make sense, but, but nonetheless... He's telling us a message that those, some people received it, they heard it, but the message, the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not unified by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed entered that rest. 
We who believe have entered that rest. I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that you have entered a level of rest? Because if you believe it, then there is an indictment on you that you are in sin. Every moment that you say you have rest, yet you act in anxiety. Every moment you have rest, but you thought that there existed a candidate that could take away your rest, you sinned against God. It's one thing to say, well, this person gets selected, it's all going to, you could say that, but did you really believe that? Okay, you shouldn't have believed that, not for a second. Because if you believed it, you have empowered your flesh to sin against you. And to sin against the promise of God, you have, you have diminished yourself to a citizen of a country. And you have taken away your power as a citizen of the kingdom of God, where no man rules the kingdom of God. And because men do not rule, they cannot destroy it. Hello, somebody. Doesn't the Bible say that whatever does not come from faith is sin? So all of your fears are unsubstantiated because they don't come from faith. So to believe in your fear is sin. But we only like to talk about the sins that bother us. We just like to talk about the sins of the flesh. But we, we very seldom talk about the sin of the mind. The sin, the sin that doesn't just rest in your body parts, the one that you can drink and smoke and sleep around and do all these things, those are not even the ones that really kill you. Those are the, the physical sins are the ones that are very easy. Ask God for forgiveness. Change your approach. Change what you value. Change the reason why you do those things. And those things drop. But it is harder to come against yourself mentally. Because you think certain things because you need to, because you believe you need to think that way. And it is easier for you to stop smoking than for you to stop thinking. And because you think a certain way, you'll go, you, the reason why you go back to bad habits is because you didn't stop the thinking of it. So you stopped the thing because of a temporary decision, but the decision didn't uphold in your mind because you didn't, you didn't transform the root system of it. So roots of bitterness were still there. So you chopped the decision. I'm going to stop this. But you didn't kill the system. So it's only a matter of time before the thing that you put on top of it. You know, you put your Bible on top of your sin. And then you stop paying attention. You didn't notice that it was growing back and your Bible was slipping off. Because in order for the Bible to be effective, you have to actually read it. Remember? Right? Remember when you had a Bible? And we used to be like, hey, read the Bible. Remember those days? Now the Bible is like a luxury. The Bible is like, you know, a reference point. It's almost like we treat the Bible as what people do when they write, you know, term papers and dissertations where you have to have a reference the Bible has become a reference so we can fact check preachers. It's become a reference so I can say, hey, I didn't make this up. It's actually written somewhere. That's not what the Bible's for. It isn't to fact check. The Bible is for you to live by. Amen. Every word. That proceeds out of the mouth of God is your bread of life. So to enter into his rest is to constantly be connected to him. And the only way you can connect to him is by the entrance of his word. Look at, look at, uh, for, look at Psalms 119. Baby, if you could read for me Psalm 119, verse 129 
I'm going to one, 129 and 132. 129. Uh-huh. Verse 129 to 132. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me, be gracious, and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Amen. Look at, look at how different he is from you. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. Yet if I ask you what's the testimony of Jesus, you wonder what I'm talking about. If I tell you, give me a, talk to me about Jesus, tell me a couple stories. You, you, you have to, ah, uh, let me, ah, uh, I think I remember. Uh, tell me a Bible story. Ah, uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Ah. Uh, You see people's brain, right? Which means they're far from it. You put a microphone on average person. You believe God? Yes. You love his, You think the Bible is credible? Oh, yes. What's your favorite verse? Ah. Uh, they give you one of these. The whole Bible is good. I mean, how could I have a favorite verse? It's all so good. Not reader. Non-reader. The un- look at what it says, my soul keeps them. Not even, he's saying, he's not even talking about I memorize them. My soul keeps them. That means this, your word is, is my filter. I, everything that runs through my mind has to be filtered by the word. I keep them in my soul. The unfolding of your words gives light. Which unfolding is almost like, you know, uh, you make your bed and then, you know, the, and at night you unfold, right, your, your, your blanket so you can rest on it. But the more you unfold it, the larger it gets. The more you unfold it, you, you smell the freshness of it. The more you unfold it. David is talking about the psalmist is saying, I, the unfolding of your word. The exposure to your word. The more I read it. The more it feeds, it brings light. Do you think, how do you think when there's light in your mind versus when there's darkness? How could you have anxiety when there's light in your mind? You can't even sustain anxiety. Anxiety needs an environment to live. And ingredient number one is darkness. Fear of what I don't know. Making up scenarios because I can't see clearly, I can't think clearly, and that's darkness where there's confusion. Yet I told you a million times that he's not the author of confusion, and you go, "Uh uh-huh. Because you heard it. But you didn't agree with it. You didn't receive it. You didn't even need it at the time. It imparts understanding to the simple. See, some, some of you don't get it because you're too complex. You're too complex. You, you keep wanting God to give you a, 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 a special thing. Something that was never heard before. Yet what is heard is what you need and you want something you never heard. How do you know you never heard it? You don't know the basics. And what, which means what you're looking for is wrong. The whole search is wrong. Instead of looking for what's special, search what he already said. Because you're trying to find something new that God is going to create, yet he's in his Sabbath. He's going to create nothing else. Get it through your thick skull. 
He's not going to create anything else. It is finished. But we keep praying for new opportunities. We keep praying for something new, something new. And you, you misunderstand the definition of what he means by new. It's new to you. I'm doing a new thing. It doesn't mean he's going to create something new. It means I'm going to open your eyes to reveal to you what I already did. I, now that you are ready to receive something new, I'm now going to introduce to you what I already did. I already have a life for you. I already have a plan for you. I don't have to bring another plan. I don't have to create a new plan. I got to get you to the place where you understand what this plan is. Where you can appreciate it and see it. I open my mouth and I pant. What does pant mean? Not pants. Pants. What does that mean? This is what a dog does when he's hot and thirsty. He takes his tongue out. <laughs> the psalmist writes, as a deer pants at the water brook, so pant I after thee, O God. I want you so bad that, that, that I'm anticipating opening the scriptures. Before I get to the word, I'm already like, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. Where is it? Where is it? You can't wait. The app is too slow. <laughs> Hurry up! <laughs> That's what it means to pant. To eagerly wait for something that is so close you can, you can drool because it's right there. Because I long for your commandments. I long for your commandments. Even though David has read his commandments, he still longs for them. Just because you know the commandments doesn't mean you have all the revelation of the commandments. Just because you have heard God's word doesn't mean you have all the revelation of what you heard. Almost every time God wants to show me something, he shows me the same scripture. I don't know if you guys have ever checked. They have never, there is no Bible 2.0. The Bible doesn't get updated. There's no new stories in it. They didn't add, so, oh, by the way, Jesus did something else we forgot to tell you. Unnecessary. It means what's in there is enough for you to believe. The Bible don't need to get updated. You need to get updated to see what's already there. So when God wants to bring revelation, he brings you the same word, but he changes you. So now you see it differently. So you go, oh... So you wonder why God puts you through scenarios and why he puts you through situations. Because it's the situation that's going to have a, it's going to make change you. The chemical structure of your mind, your body starts to anticipate need. And when the need comes out of the word, it brings answers. So this repeated process Put you in a place where you, I need the word, I need the word, I need the word. Because every good result that came from your life came from reading scripture. Amen. Why? Because everything that he's going to do, he already did it before he started. He didn't put you on the earth at the year you were born until your life was finished. All of the pathways were worked out. And yes, we have free will because we can choose any path that we want. The problem is when corruption came, we can choose evil and destruction. 
And he doesn't do anything about that because it's your destruction to keep. But even he worked out the fact that you have a choice to live. And if you choose him, you go back to the ways of Adam. You go back to the original man whose heart was open to God. That's why when you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he gives you a gift. What's the gift? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Anyone who tells you, if you do not speak in tongues, you are not saved, that's demonic. Anyone that tells you that receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is not enough, should give back their card, whatever card they got, to say what they said. Because it simply isn't true. In all, here's why. In order for you to perceive God, you need his spirit. How do you know it's God talking to you unless his spirit opened your eyes? How do you understand scripture without your eyes being open? Can the flesh open the eyes to see the spirit? In order for you to be saved, you must be acceptable to God, which means there has to be an instant transformation. Now, the flesh isn't going. The flesh is staying. That's why you struggle with this flesh, because your flesh has to go back to the ground. But your spirit goes back to God. Why? Because he's the one that gave it to you. Your spirit's not yours. And that spirit that was corrupted has now been made incorruptible because it is now transformed in the image of his son, which is perfect. So in me dwells perfection. That's why my soul struggles because I'm perfect in part and I'm corrupt in part. This is why I want to do good. But when I let my flesh take control, I can't do good. Even while I'm saying I should not do this, I do it. And then when I'm doing good, I'm thinking evil. What is wrong with us? What's wrong with us is our situation. So there's really nothing wrong with you is the situation. And depending on what situation you lean to is the situation that manifests. Because whatever I set my heart to is the direction that I move. Whatever I set myself to be influenced to is where I'm going to move. And I want to tell you something. In the middle is not a place to be. In the middle of two opinions is not the place to be because God doesn't respect that. He said, because you were lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you were neither hot nor cold. Nothing I can do with that. When we were speaking to the men, we, we had to make a decision. And he said, what's worse? Because we all worried about making the right decision. And I said, there's only one thing worse than a bad decision. And that's no decision. No decision doesn't provoke the spirit of God. Inactivity, indecision keeps you in stagnation. And the Holy Spirit doesn't move when there's stagnation. It activates when you move. Even if I move in the wrong direction, the Holy Spirit is going to activate. It will activate while I'm walking towards sin. He says, what are we doing here? What's going on? Why are you doing this? And inside of us, there's an internal struggle. Why? Because you were given a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit to help you to discern between good and evil. Why? Because your flesh is corrupted. It only wants evil. Even when it wants good, it has evil intentions of why it wants that. It's manipulative in the good that it wants to seek. But the Holy Spirit doesn't manipulate. I want good because it's good. I want what's right because it's right because it's right. The fact that you speak in tongues is simply a manifestation of the prayer language that is already in you. Because if it wasn't in you, you'd be done by now. The Bible said the spirit itself intercedes for us with groanings, with utterings that you cannot 
You don't sometimes know what it is. Sometimes the environment isn't right. And I ain't talking about the church environment. I'm talking about this environment. This environment fights the Holy Spirit. It fights the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. It fights everything. But once you start transitioning and you start to feed your mind something different. Remember the Bible we talked about a little while ago? That book. You feed it that information and it starts to duplicate the information that you fed it. If you feed yourself trash, it will also duplicate trash. I'll prove it to you. How many of you grew up in the 90s? (laughs) You remember something called gangster rap? (laughs) Keep it gangster, y'all. Keep it gangster. And you used to put your headphones on and your hoodie. And your Tims. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you used to have a lean and a bop. And you used to look at people hard. You used to say stuff like, what you looking at? For no reason. What you're looking at was a thing. If you look at me wrong, where do we get that from? The music that we were listening to in those headphones, okay, the walk and the bop and the whole style and the whole culture that we accepted was was engaging violence. It was engaging putting your chest out. Don't let nobody do this to you and all this kind of garbage. And all it, it did anyone, did it bring prosperity to anyone except the artist singing it? No. Matter of fact, in order to start making money, you have to throw all that stuff out and say, I can't, I can't do that at this job. You start to realize they don't pay people $100,000 a year to act like that. The only people making money off of that is, this, is, is maybe not even the artists, is the executives and the owners of the record labels that were making the money. So people started to say, okay, this is not, not going to last very, very long. It's entertaining. But when you're young, you think that's life. When we were young, we thought that the people singing that stuff were actually that. Little did we know, that's not even who they were. They were taking polls off of what we wanted to hear, and they fed it back to us. Which means we created a world because the more we thought about it, the more we wanted it, the more we wanted it, the more record labels fed us back what we said we wanted. And we were children. Hello, somebody. It's still happening today. The music sounds different, but it's the same devil operating his same game. No no new thing under the sun. So the enemy still wants to trap us, and he still has his ways. But God has his ways too. Because while he thinks he can track your behavior, because I want you to understand, the devil cannot really track you. All he can do is study what you did. He has no idea what you're going to do. He can only predict future behavior because the best way for me to guess what you're going to do is what you did. So the enemy does not ever see you as what you will be. He only sees you as who you were. Hello, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, he can't see me another way. Because he can't see the future. Because he don't have one. You can only see where you're going. Satan doesn't see where he's going. He's panicking over the hour. He has no idea when he's going to end. And he doesn't get to sleep it off. He doesn't get to wake up. It's okay. Tomorrow's another day. He's in the same nightmare all of his existence. And all he wants to do is to make us live his nightmare. So his anxiety, he wants to give to us. His panic, his worry, his fear, he wants to give to us. Devil is full of fear. Full of fear. Because in order for you to destroy a being like him, uh, you don't kill that with a knife. The kind of torture that he's anticipating is nothing you've ever seen before. Can you imagine that he has to pay for all he did? I just want to leave it like that. 
He has to pay for all that he did. Even he has to pay for what he did to Jesus on the cross. For the orders that he gave when they whipped him with cats of nine tails and ripped the skin from his body, he has to pay for that. For all the disciples who were beheaded, he has to pay for that. For every attack that came against you that was ordered by his kingdom, he has to pay for all of that. It means, it means it's going to take a while for him to pay for that. And he knows it. It ain't going to be a day of destruction. It's going to be a systematic season of destruction. It means in order to destroy the devil and for him to pay for all his sins, he must be destroyed over a period perhaps of a million years. Who knows? How do you act when you know that's coming? You panic. And here we are. We go about our day. We have no idea the spirit that is trying to attack us. The Bible said we have to gird up our loins. Be ready at all times. Yet, we also have to have joy at all times. This is crazy. Be ready for an attack and be joyful. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let me tell you something. That's a powerful place to be. That state of mind needs to be maintained. It's not a, I heard the preaching, I'm good for 20 years. No, that's such a hard place to be that it takes maintenance to stay there. To fight a battle and have peace. You have to constantly be fighting what you see with what you read, what I see with what's in my heart. I got to constantly be reconciling my soul back to the reality that God gave me. I have to constantly renew my faith, renew my mind. I got to constantly wash my feet from the corruption of this world. If I'm in business, I got to constantly check myself. I got to check the source of my income. That's why God just, look, there's some things you can't think about. So he sets up systems, systems of prayer, systems of reading your word. If you want to take care of your money, he gives us systems of tithes and offerings. Why? So you don't sit there worried about your money all day. You're not supposed to be worrying about your finances. You're supposed to let him partner with you and give it to him and then follow him for what he wants you to do. The things that you cannot get paid for are the most important things in this world. Amen. Yet you want to focus on your work more than him. Why? When your work is perishing. No matter how much money you make, you can't take none of it with you. And for as much money you leave to your kids, it takes them a fraction of time to lose it all. If you don't spend time with God, everything you built will crumble. You've seen it. I don't have to spend time telling you this. But when we struggle, understand that we are fighting our rest. When we don't read the word, we're fighting our rest. So, yeah, we like to part. I'm, I'm, I'm in a battle. I'm ready to fight spiritual demonic attacks and all this kind of stuff. But what good is that if while you're fighting, you don't have joy and peace? Even your fight is wrong if you fight the devil with anxiety. If I fight the devil while I'm anxious, I'm fighting on his ring and I can't win. Because I'm fighting darkness in darkness. You know why we win the battle all the time? It's because we fight from light. If the ring that you are fighting in is lit up, the devil would like to him, he could win. But because the ring is light, what happens to his shadow? What happens to darkness when it comes in the middle of lights? It disappears. So that's why he can tell you, fight the battle and smile. Fight the battle and have peace and get dressed and put your armor and show up to the fight. But don't step out of the ring because that's where the light is. 
So here you are, think you're big and bad. You take your armor and you just want to walk anywhere in the middle of darkness and have a fight with dark powers in darkness. Good luck. That's why even when deliverance is happening, first we must worship God. Then we thank God. Then we praise him for what he does. In other words, we light up the whole environment. Light everything up. And once you light it up, in the name of Jesus, now it's easy. Because really what I'm saying, and I'm going all over the place, I got to bring it back. When I say in the name of Jesus... I'm not saying in the magical name of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in the way that Jesus would do it. I'm saying because Jesus already gave me power. I'm saying because I'm in alignment with his will, let this happen. That's what I'm saying. The name of Jesus is not a magic trick. Otherwise, everyone who was born with the name of Jesus can fly in the air and walk on water. And they can't. Because there's nothing magical about you naming your child Jesus. We got a bunch of Jesus. We got Jesus Hernandez. Jesus Martinez. Jesus Smith. There's all type of Jesuses. Okay? We're talking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one who died on the cross for me and you. His, it ain't the magic, it ain't the spelling of his name that's magic. It's who he is where the power lies. So when you say in the name of Jesus, you better have a relationship with Jesus. Because it isn't you saying the name, it's, all right, let's check who are you. Where do you stand in the spiritual realm where your name is affiliated with Jesus? And how affiliated are you exactly? We don't like that question. We, we like, hey, I, I'm a Christian. I'm affiliated with Jesus Christ. When a demon says, but how affiliated are you? When's the last time you talked to Jesus? Can you cast me out like you just talked to him right now? How do I even know there's going to be a consequence in messing with you? You're so disconnected from your Jesus that by the time he finds out what happened, I'm gone. Somebody's waking up today. In verse 30, 132, he says, turn to me and be gracious to me. As is your way to those who love your name. You know where David's confidence came from? He always knew what was going to happen. Because he knew who God was. And he studied what God does. He says, I know, I know how you do. He didn't say, look at the difference between him and you. God, please be gracious to me. God, please, please help me. God, please look on me. It's not what David said. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way. Means I don't have to beg you to do it. This is what you always do. I know what you're going to do. I'm not begging you. He's saying, Lord, do what you always do. Because this is what you do to people who love your name. So I'm not going to focus on manipulating you. I'm not focusing on making you pity me. I'm not going to focus you on I need to be heard. I need you to see my situation. Because that means he's blind. I need you to hear what I'm saying. That means he's deaf. I need you to notice what's happening. That means he don't know everything. Even your prayers are insulting without you even knowing it. Can you imagine your kid coming up to you and saying, Mom, can you please love me? How many mothers will be insulted if your child says, Mom, could you please love me? Mom, can you finally love me? None of you are going to say, oh, of course. The first thing you're going to feel is insulted. Yes or no? Yeah. 
Brothers, what if your son comes up to you and he says, Dad, can you be a father, please? Can you be a father to me, please? Can you be a father? For the first time, please, can you be a father? Do you go, oh, son, of course. Of course, I'm going to start being a father to you. Because what else was I doing this whole time? I'm so sorry. Or do you go, where you been? We got a problem. What, what does that mean? What are you trying to say? We don't even know that half of our prayers are insulting. Because you don't learn because you don't read. And that's where most of our problems come. That's why David's attitude was different. He said, as you do. As it is your way. To those who love your name. In other words, I don't got to worry about what you do. Who you are is proven. Who you are is, is done. I'm the one that's developing. I'm the one who we don't know about. I'm the one whose love is frickle and frail. I'm the one who has attention deficit. I'm the one that doesn't concentrate. I'm the one that doesn't read. I'm the one that's missing a few screws. You're straight. And I know what you do to those who love your name. So let me focus on me loving you. Not you helping me. Because I already know what you do to people who love you. And this is our problem. We spend more time asking God to do for us disproportionately more than what we do for him. Unprovoked worship. Unprovoked praise. Unprovoked witness. In other words, you witness without him having to say it. You worship unscheduled. It's easy to worship when we have a scheduled meeting. We're going to worship at this time. We're going to sing these songs. And it's going to be for this long. You don't need no help for that. You just got to show up. Done. It's done for you worship. That's what I call it. Done for you. On demand. But for you to have unscripted, unscheduled time with God means it came from you. You want to draw his attention? Be spontaneous in your relationship with him. Stop the car. Say, you know what? I need to spend time with you, Lord. I'm controlling this moment in history. I'm controlling this moment. I'm giving it to you. This is the only thing the enemy never sees coming. He cannot tell where you're going to stop and praise God. He has no idea. All he can do is track your previous behavior. That's why he, so most of us, he doesn't really care that you came to church. See, some people are tied up and they go, I don't want to come to church. I gotta, I'm still in sin and I, I got to get my stuff right. The reason why he doesn't care that we come to church is because he sees what you do after church. And because he knows what you did a couple weeks ago after church, he's not worried. He's like, she's going to do the same thing. He's going to do the same thing. They praise God. They worship. They went home and they were worried again. It didn't take them two hours to start worrying about Monday morning. Which means it did nothing what they heard. You left church. Soon as you left, you was gossiping. Can you believe what the pastor said? I don't know what's wrong with that cat. Can you, 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 saw what, you saw what Pastor Riley was wearing? You saw this and you start yapping, 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 yapping. You start, you start paying attention more about what I said and what's in between and what's behind what I said than worrying about what the Holy Spirit was trying to get to you. Instead of you saying, I wonder what the Holy Ghost is trying to say because Pastor this said, no, you know, oh, I, somebody must have got Pastor upset. That's why he was saying that. I'm sorry, how does that help you? So because the enemy saw that, and then he saw what you did afterwards, he's not worried about you coming next time. She's like, well, if past behavior dictates the future, I have nothing to worry about. She's no threat to the kingdom. He's no threat to the kingdom. Matter of fact, it's beneficial that I keep them in that church so they can do my job to bring disunity, okay, to bring division, okay, to quench the Holy Spirit. They're doing a better job than me. 
It will surprise you how sometimes we do the devil's agenda more and with ease because we act like moles in an organization. We bring demonic agenda right into the middle, boop, unattached and accepted. That's what a mole does. You seen the movies? They cozy up in the organization. They get a position. They get trusted. And then ah, whatever they say, they plan it. And they also take information, go back. Many of us are not acting as believers. We're acting as moles. Except you don't even know that that's what you are. But every time you bring anxiety, every time you bring ungodly things, every time you bring something from the, the, the darkness into the light, you act as a mole. And you leave your nonsense here. Can we be transparent? How many of you have witnessed a mole in the church? Where they brought stuff that messed things up. Division. Gossip. Slander. Made you, made you think twice about your leaders. Divided you from your confidence in your own church. They were agents of darkness. Working against the will of God. These people go from church to church as agents of Satan, bringing destruction wherever they go. And when you ask them, how come you're not in your old church? I don't know. <laughs> always the reason, be careful with these folks. The reason is always very vague. And it's never their fault. It's never like, look, man, I was a gossiper and I did this, but I had to repent. But I was so messed up in the head, it wasn't the time. And I'm asking God to, I'm asking God to forgive me so I don't do the same thing in this church. When's the last time you heard that testimony? <laughs> never. Because the people that are like that repent and stay where God assigned them to. Right. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Is, is my video ready? Can we cue that up? I want to go to that next. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. The, the New King James, the King James had a word that was switched in that the King James reads that he who began a good work will finish it on the day of Jesus Christ. The reason why they changed the translation is because Jesus already finished it. The proper translation is bring it to or perform it. The actual translation should read, he who began a good work will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, what he did and his decision is already done. It is he's bringing it and performing it until the last day. So when it says completion, it doesn't mean that he's going to finish the thought. Completion means it's going to be done what he already did. So I want you to think of this, that whatever God started in you, he's going to continue to perform that thing because the decision of who you are and what you shall be and what you could be, the decision's already done. The only thing that's missing is a man or woman of God willing to do the work to pull it down from the hidden to the visible. And in order for you to take it from the hidden realm to the visible realm is revelation of what to do with it. And once you are confident in what to do with it, it changes your life. Amen. Struggles start to change. Things that you wouldn't do because you weren't confident, it starts to change. And things that you were struggling with start to disappear because now you have tools to fight. That's why the Bible said the entrance, the entrance, the unfolding of your word, it brings light. 
which means on an everyday basis, I start off dark. So when you make decisions in darkness, you're already lost because it's already the wrong decision because anything about light is God. Make sense? Okay, uh, let's, let's watch this video. I want you to see something. I'm going to spell that out more here in a moment. Two times a week, negligible effect. Now, at three times a week, there was a blip on the map. Like, there was a heartbeat. Something happened. Again, a heartbeat. Okay. But here was the profound discovery. When we're in the scripture four times a week, it literally spikes off the chart. You would expect that it'd be one, two, th I mean, there'd be a gradual incline right. on the effect and impact that would have in your life, but it was literally one, two, three, four, something radically happens. Okay, you got my curiosity. To this what, extent. What kind of behavior is being affected? Feeling lonely drops 30%. Wow. Ang four times a week in the four Bible. Four times a week in the Bible. Okay. Anger issues drop 32%. Uh, bitterness in relationships, marriage, a relationship with your kids, and so on, drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant. You know, if there was one area when I'm talking with people that, that they'll be honest about is they just feel spiritually stagnant. Ask them the question, how much time are you spending in Scripture? If they're in the Scripture four times a week or more, it drops 60%. Wow. Viewing pornography drops 61%. That's very important. Now, on a flip positive side, sharing your faith wow. jumps 200%. Wow. Because you have a confidence in God's word. And then discipling others jumps 230%. Everything that we do and don't do in the kingdom is linked to our time with God. Specifically, how much content we consume of the scripture. So the study showed after it was, it took the fourth time. See, it takes your mind a while to believe that you're about it. You read it once, could be a blip, could be a mistake. You do it twice, could be religion. You do it three times, okay. He said it was a little, little blip. On the fourth time, okay, this ain't going to change. This is what I want. Your mind is listening to your actions. So when you gossip four times a week, when you watch porn four times a week, when you spike your anger four times a week, anything that you do, doing it once or twice is, is not what brings change. It's when you are habitual at it. It starts to change everything. Now, this can be in grace or it can also be in a negative state. Which, which one are you going to do? Because whatever you think of is what you're going to reproduce. That's why when I'm in the word, I keep growing and growing and growing and growing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Till, till it starts becoming 10 times 20 times a day in the Word. How do you get 20 times a day in the Word? Is when you take the Word, you memorize it, and you mull it over. And every time you make a decision, you bring up a scripture. Every time somebody says a word, you got a scripture for it. Every time someone's arguing, you got a scripture for it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The word starts to now, it has to go from me looking for it to your mind starts looking for it. And it starts to scan the scriptures because you have studied the word so much that now your brain is linked to going back to it. So it's no longer about being religious, having to open up a paper Bible and doing this. It's you're going to do that until. Okay. You do the sit down, the whole thing, until you know it all. Once you know it all, now you're visiting to see Revelation. But the reason why some of you are not in Revelation is because you don't even, you haven't even got a first coat on it. Okay? The first coat is just a prime coat, which means you got to read the whole thing. And after you read the whole thing, you should be confused. I don't know what this is all about. This don't make sense. This don't make sense. 
Then guess what happens? You go over it again. Ah, it's making more sense now. The Holy Spirit's filling in the blanks for me. Okay, now I see it. Throw another coat on it. Read that thing again. Then all of a sudden, you start seeing it differently. Look at it sideways. Turn it upside down. Look at it from the bottom. Look at it from the top. Look at it sideways. I, listen, when, when you read scripture, you're not supposed to be reading it fast. You ought to read a, a passage of scripture and just wait and say, hmm. Let me read that again. And then pray. Let me read that again. I feel like God is leading me to here, but I don't see it yet. And you wonder why God wants you to look at it once, look at it twice, read it again, and then read it again and read it. Why? Because he wants your flesh to train itself. We're doing this today. We're believing this today. So guess what happens when you run, when you run into a believer? First thing, first thing in, last thing in is the first thing in. So the last thing you say is the most important thing that you consumed. So what happens when you're just watching nonsense all day? And you start talking. Nonsense comes out. Can I be honest with you? You know what's the most annoying thing to, to me? To spend time in the scripture and I run into a believer full of trash. And I want to have a spiritual conversation. And the only thing they're talking about, sports, the weather, my job. And I'm like, Lord, help me. Now I got to digress into the flesh. Now I got to bring all this to, okay, let's have this, this boring conversation about our lives that all of it is going nowhere anyway. It can be frustrating to be in the spirit because all you want is to have conversations of the spirit. So, you, you're, so what happened is it be, you get a little lonely because the people you can have that conversation with shrinks. Okay? It shrinks. That's why we need to get together every week. And watch this. Even in get together every week, you know how much can change from one Sunday to Sunday? Even if we do service every day, 24 hours is still enough to get you far from God. Because it's the habits that we maintain. The moment that we say, okay, I, let me stop my nonsense and let me go into this new way of life and consume this thing, I'm going to walk in rest. Because you start to realize, I am in a preordained state of victory Every single day. When you start to witness to someone, now you can be spontaneous. You know why? Because the devil has no idea of what you're going to do with the word that's in you. He has zero idea. So he got to chase you now. It's not like he ain't going to do nothing. He ain't going to do nothing. He read that word like he read a postcard. She read that word like it was a joke. She ain't going to do nothing with that. Why? Because he knows the stats. He doesn't have to ask people. His kingdom monitors people. And he monitors what happens as a result. That's why you start getting attacked when you start getting more into your word. Because he, does, he doesn't want to get you to the place of it becoming a habit. So you wonder why you read the Bible once and nothing happened. You read the Bible twice and you weren't attacked. You read it three times. But around the fourth time, here's what's going to happen. Phone calls. Distractions. Because now all of a sudden, the kingdom of darkness is alerted. Hey, she's about to get to the place of concentration. He's about to get to the place of focus. He's about to get to the place where nothing is more important than this. And if they get there, we're in trouble. Because now we can't. Now it doesn't matter what we monitor. They're going to be off the cameras. We can't follow them anymore. Because they're going to become what John had prophesied that they would become. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 8, and I'll finish with this. John chapter 3 and verse 8 is telling us of how we need to be invisible to the kingdom of darkness. Watch this. Re read for me John 3 and 8.
the wind blows where it wishes and you hear sounds, it sounds, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Everyone that is born of the spirit and stays in the spirit becomes like wind. Unpredictable where it blows because you never see the force behind it. Yeah, you want to kill demonic attacks, become invisible. can't attack where you can't see. You could see me standing here. You have no idea where the attack is, where my counterattack is coming from. He who has an ear, listen to what I'm saying. You can attack me, but you cannot see where my counterattack is coming from. Because this battle is not of the flesh. Our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Means the stronghold in here, I'm pulling it down. And the stronghold outside of me, I'm also putting it down. And the enemies that come against me, I got something for them, but they can't see where it's coming from. That's why they dare to attack you. Because they're counting on that you're going to do what you used to do. The moment that they see the power that you have, and the blow that you hit them with, and they say, what? How could, it, how could she? I didn't see that coming. Fear comes into the heart of the enemy when you strike a blow that they didn't see coming. And when the Holy Spirit strikes a blow, it's a, it's a blow that damages the kingdom of darkness. And it brings intimidation that when you show up, demons tremble. At the sound of his name. Because they know that Jesus is unpredictable. Jesus was standing right in front of them. And the demons were nervous. The disciples weren't nervous. Because the disciples says, well, I mean, Jesus standing here. I mean, the most he can do is wave his hand. The most he can do is kick and scream. But the demons knew. Yeah, Jesus is there, but. He can, he's also somewhere else right now. And if he does that other unpredictable stuff, while he's standing there, he can attack us from the back. You heard what I said? Yes. They were afraid of Christ because while Christ was standing in front of them, they knew that he had the power to stand behind them and surround them as well. They said, what do you have to do with us? Plead, we, we're pleading with you, let us not to leave the region because we know what you could do uh -huh, come on. if you really wanted to. We know what you could do. His disciples were like, what? What could he do? <laughs> Until he gave them of his spirit. And then the disciples woke up another side of them that was so powerful that they no longer valued their lives. Uh -huh. They said, all you can do is kill this flesh. Why? Because Jesus opened their understanding. They were soon as Christ opened the understanding, they understood all you can do is kill me. So I'm gonna preach until you kill me. Because I know this isn't over. And this is worth, Paul writes, a far more exceeding weight of glory. And in, in what I understand is going to happen by the benefit of preaching this word than by the enemies that all they can do is attack this flesh. That's all for today. I, I think that's already too much. Touch your neighbor, stand up and say it's already done. So it's already done. I already won. Victory is mine. The only thing I have to do is line up, get my head in his word. I'm already free. I'm already free. I, 
I, I just have to grab it. I just can't see it because my eyes are too foggy. All I'm thinking of is the flesh. All I'm thinking about is my worries. All I'm thinking about is the things that I don't know. All I'm worried about is I'm worried because I don't know if it's going to work. People in the scripture never worry about if it's going to work. We just know it's going to work. We don't need people to affirm us. We've been affirmed. People that in their word never go, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It doesn't even come out. We can't. It doesn't come out anymore. Why? Because I don't think like that anymore. I already know the answers. All the questions that I have. And the things that I don't know. He gave me an umbrella policy. <laughs> where, where, where Minister Edward at? I think he's taking care of the baby. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you're in insurance, you know what an umbrella policy is. Umbrella policy is whatever this didn't cover. I got a policy that covers everything. Some of you are worried because there's some specifics that you're worried about. And you don't even know that if God didn't give you a specific answer, it's because you're under an umbrella. It means while you get the revelation, I got you. I don't want you to get involved in that. I don't want you to bother yourself with it. It's enough what you already received. Battle with what I showed you first. Win with what I gave you first before you start worrying about taking over the world. I got the world. Didn't he say that? In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So how can you as a Christian... Be worried about that some politician is going to ruin the world. You're in sin. Because you're thinking not by faith. You're thinking by fear. And whatever doesn't come from faith is sin. Just as you get insulted if your children said, Mom, can you love me please? Dad, can you be a father? Stop asking God to be what he already is. Spend that time loving him. I'd rather you pray this, Lord, show me. Show me, Lord. I know you love me. Show me, Lord. Show me your glory. Give me more of you. See, if your child comes up to you and says, Mom, I know you love me. I want to get to know you better. Father, Dad, I know you love me. I'm not asking you to be a father. I'm asking you, I want to get to know you more. I want to have fellowship with you. No parent will respond with anything other than come. Come, come close. Come unto me. All who are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You're confused? Come, I'll give you wisdom. You're in darkness? Come, I'll give you light. Stop praying for God to be who he already is. Stop praying for him to do what he already did. And start praying, Lord, simply show me. Show me who I am. Show me how I can get close to you. I know I can. Show me how. I can't see how I can go higher. But I know that I'm seated in heavenly places. Show me how to break through. And spend all of your time looking for the evidence of your faith. Spend all of your time looking to get closer. Stop asking him to be what he already is. Stop asking him to do what he already did. If you have faith, you're already a winner. Stop asking to be a winner. It goes against your faith. Believe. How many can believe today that you are what God called you to be? You're already in victory. 
So let's pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Father in heaven, I know you love me. I know you are for us. I know that you love us all. Yet sometimes we miss the mark. Help me, help us to break through so that we can know you better, so we can know your love, so we can believe in your truth. Help my unbelief, forgive my sins, and show me who you are. Allow me to walk closer to you. When I read my word, open the scriptures. Open my ears. I want to hear you. Open my eyes. I want to see you. Open my mind. I want to understand you. And bless my body and my health. So I have no excuses. So I have no holds. So I have no excuses to act out what you have told me already. Lord Jesus, from this moment forward, I will receive your spirit. I will walk by faith and not by sight because even if I cannot see I am not in darkness even when my eyes are blind I'm still surrounded by light until I can be mature enough where you open my eyes because many times I am not ready to see even when you are ready to show me. So from this day forward, I will raise myself to be a man or woman of God, whatever you are, to mature myself and to become what you already set me up to be. And in that place, I will find my joy. I will find my power. I will find my assignment. I will find my purpose. I will find my worship. I will find my praise. I will sharpen my sword in that place. I will move into that place. And from there, I will attack the enemy's camp. That place is called the kingdom of God. Clap your hands and give him praise. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes we are bound because a lot of time has gone by and we have not connected to him. All type of things happen when your connection is, is off. When you're not grounded to him, you can have power. But God forbid if you have power and you're not grounded, If you don't ground an electrical circuit and all you do is feed it power, you ever seen a, a power line that's not grounded? It's dangerous. It's all over the place. It throws power out of context. Whenever I see a preacher standing up there, not grounded, that's a dangerous preacher. It, slapping everybody. But when you're grounded, even when I insult you, you have to say, thank you, Jesus. The man of God is right. You know what you do when you're not grounded? How dare he? 
How dare he say this about me? But when you get grounded, you go. You say the man of God is right. I got to get into it. Man of God is right. I should have been winning. Lord, you're right. I got to get on it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm, I'm being presumptuous in assuming that you know I love you. Would that be a fair presumption? So even when I'm mean to you, you know what? I, I'm just... Is that study show that adults learn when they get agitated faster than being nice? So I apologize in advance if you're offended by what I say. My only goal is to do what God told me to get you to a place where you're seated in the kingdom where you're supposed to be. Because you can rule from there your whole life. Every time you jump off of your seat in the kingdom, you start chasing money, you start chasing opportunity, you start chasing things. When you're seated correctly, things come to you. You call from where you are. You send from where you are. And you be like Jesus. When the man said, I'm a man of authority. I tell this one, go and he goes. This one, come and he comes. He goes, you're better than me. You don't got to go to my house. Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. And you thought that was a cute story. It wasn't just a cute story. It was an example of where you're supposed to be in your life right now. You don't have to get up off your chair to go do it. From where you are, command it. If you're having trouble in your marriage right now, here's your mistake. Babe, we need to go on a vacation. Because the peace is over there. We got to jump on a plane so we can find peace. No. I'm not going to wait and argue on the way to a vacation. Let's call peace right now. If the peace is in Aruba, get over here now. And call the peace here. Why you got to wait to rent an Airbnb in Hawaii to have peace? When I get to the beach and I see the whales, I'm going to have... When Jesus said, my peace, I give. I give. Which means he gave to you. It means you can have it right now. Are you ready for that peace? Let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe in your word. And based on your word, you told us that you gave us peace. Not of this world, but it came from you. I claim that peace in the middle of the storm. In the name of Jesus. So that I don't panic when everything starts to crumble. Instead of panicking, I will be more strong and more certain of who I am. Because my peace is already here. In Jesus' name, amen.